on this occasion with strong links to our host country, Japan. Firstly, it is the 70th anniversary of the United Nations organization, which underpins the prevailing global system of peace and security with its charter and the framework of norms and values it upholds. Next, it is the 60th anniversary of our bedrock document and surely one of the earliest formulations of the humanitarian pledge that is much talked about today, the 1955 London Manifesto of our founding fathers, Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, one of whose co-signatories was Professor Hideki Yukawa, the Nobel Physics Laureate from Kyoto University in Japan. And it is the 20th anniversary of the award of the Nobel Peace Prize jointly to Pagwash and to one of its illustrious founders, Sir Joseph Rothblatt, three months after the Pagwash conference held in Hiroshima in that year. Anniversaries, ladies and gentlemen, are not merely sentimental occasions. They are valuable opportunities for stock taking, surveying the road traverse and preparing for the journey ahead. On a more somber note, we are observing the 70th anniversary of the dropping of the plutonium bomb Fat Man by the USA of the city of Nagasaki on August 9, 1945, killing 35 to 40,000 people outright with an eventual total of 60,000 to 80,000 fatalities, colossal property damage and environmental pollution. We pay homage to the memory of those who were killed. To the survivors of both Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the Hibakusha, we express our solidarity and admiration for their tireless efforts to ensure that never again will the world witness the use of nuclear bombs. We also admire the resilience of the city of Nagasaki <coughs> to reveal itself into the vibrant metropolis that it now is. It is important also to remember other Hibakusha, victims of nuclear weapon tests elsewhere, such as in Kazakhstan. Many of you were present in the morning of the conference open when officials of the Pagwash Conference on Science and World Affairs presented globally recognized symbols of peace to the people of Nagasaki and Hiroshima in a special ceremony at the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum. This ceremony formally marked the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the 60th anniversary of the Russian Einstein Manifesto, and the 20th anniversary of the Nobel Award to the Palmwash Conference. As the press release we issued on the occasion stated, and I quote, as a reaffirmation of our international organization's continuing commitment to work actively for a world free of nuclear weapons, the Palmwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs is placing on permanent loan gold-plated official copies of the Pugwash Nobel Peace Prize medal for display in the atomic bomb museums in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We also are providing the original and a copy of the Nobel Diploma for these displays." Unquote. These symbols of peace are offered to the people of Nagasaki and Hiroshima and especially to the Hibakusha as proof that the international community has heard their calls for peace and nuclear disarmament. Together with the bomb dropped on Hiroshima earlier on August 6, we have grim reminders of the raison d'etre of Pangwash and our origin to the Cold War years when the horror of a nuclear holocaust hung over our heads. That specter, the almost 16,000 nuclear warheads being held today among nine nuclear weapon armed countries remains perhaps even more ominous and immediate than ever before. Conflicts rage in various parts of the world with new anarchic non-state actors, some of them with medieval mindsets, seeking to acquire this most destructive and inhumane weapon ever invented. Rose Gottmuller, US Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security and a friend of Pagwash, said as recently as October 19 this year in Fairbanks, Alaska. The threat from these weapons is real, and in fact, it may have increased due to the risk of terrorists seeking to acquire nuclear weapons." Unquote. 
She reminded us of President Reagan's statement that a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. Of course, what Rose Gottmaler could not say is that the only certain way to achieve President Reagan's goal is to outlaw nuclear weapons through a nuclear weapon convention, which none of the nine nuclear weapon armed states are ready to do. Nuclear disarmament, therefore, remains our central task, and we continue to focus on this priority <coughs> through the Simons Symposium, with which we began this conference, thanks to the generosity of the Simons Foundation. The gulf between the two major nuclear weapon armed nations, the USA and the Russian Federation, who together own 93% of the nuclear weapons in this world, has frozen progress in bilateral arms control and disarmament imperiling even the agreements reached in the past, such as the INF. The goal of a nuclear weapon-free world in President Obama's proud speech of 2009 has now, alas, become a mirage. Only international civil society maintains pressure for a nuclear weapons convention, supported by the UN Secretary General and His Holiness the Pope. In his most recent book, The World Order, published at the end of 2014, Dr. Henry Kissinger provided us with a historical analysis of a quest for a rule-based global order. That quest has to be undertaken today in a world where, in Kissinger's words, and I quote, chaos threatens side by side with unprecedented interdependence. In the spread of weapons of mass destruction, the disintegration of states, the impact of environmental depredation, the persistence of genocidal practices, and the spread of new technologies threatening to drive conflict beyond human control or comprehension." Unquote. Thus, in today's world, a rule-based world order seems even more remote, considering the diversity of emerging players and problems with no apparent center of gravity. Even as the slowing down of the Chinese economy has its ripple effects globally, proving how interconnected we all are, fatalistic predictions are made by commentators on the Thucydides trap, recalling the history of the Peloponnesian War, on the inevitability of war between the then established power Sparta and the aspiring power Athens, as if we are destined to repeat the mistakes of history. The recent visit of President Xi Jinping to the UK, the entry of Russia in the battle against ISIS in Syria, and the recent tripartite meeting in Seoul are examples of the cooperation that is possible among competing powers and other groups of countries. And this can serve the interests of world peace and stability. As Bangwashai recalling the Russell Einstein manifesto, we can never accept the inevitability of war. The contemporary global situation was also summarized by the UN Secretary General in his report on the work of the organization to this year's UN General Assembly when it opened in September. He wrote, and I quote, during the past year, more people were displaced than at any time since the Second World War. Desperate migrants risked everything to flee from hunger, persecution, and violence only to meet with death, discrimination, and greater desperation along the way. Conflict and crisis engulfed millions of people in Afghanistan, the Central African Republic, Darfur, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Gaza, Libya, Iraq, Mali, Somalia, South Sudan, the Syrian Arab Republic, Ukraine, and Yemen. Millions faced the brutal tactics of violent extremists, such as Boko Haram, Al Shabaab and Daesh Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, I say. While many foreign fighters found the message of such groups alluring enough to join their cause. Environmental degradation, pollution, and resource depletion continued almost unabated around the globe. There was little progress on the long stalled disarmament agenda. Countless people died of curable diseases, went to bed hungry. Very children who might have been saved with basic health care and in many other ways suffered avoidable, unacceptable levels of deprivation, fear, and hopelessness. Unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, in the face of this stark reality, 
a punkwash perspective on world affairs, beginning dialogue among uh, across divides, and our emphasis on the common bond of humanity that binds us all must be pursued vigorously in our traditional areas of activity and in the new areas that today's political, economic and technological developments have created. Climate change, cyber security, terrorism, inequalities, the refugee crisis and other challenges. Not to do so would be tantamount to sitting on the laurels of the past, including the 1995 award, the Nobel Peace Prize to Sir Joseph Rothblatt and Palkosh. It would also convert Palkosh into an anachronistic body out of touch with the times we live in. The slow progress in inducting new members globally, especially young scientists, and reinvigorating our national groups is linked to the poor climate for fund fundraising. If Pugwash functions as a confederation of autonomous national groups interacting with each other at the regional level and with Pugwash International at the global level on specific initiatives, our collective impact can be enhanced. Let me move on to the award of the Nobel Peace Prize this year, the Tunisian National Dialogue Portal, which we congratulate on their richly deserved prize. It rewards the country where the Arab Spring began originally and where democracy continues to sprout its tender shoots whilst elsewhere it has been blighted by harsh autocracy and civil strife, aggravated by proxy wars and foreign interference. The importance of forging a genuine national consensus to protect the transition to democracy is borne out by the robust Tunisian coalition <laughs> consisting of the country's largest labor union its Employers' Federation, its Lawyers' Association, and the Tunisian Human Rights Association. Despite enormous odds, Palwash has persisted with quiet diplomacy, a forte of our veteran Secretary General. In May this year, the international media reported that Afghan government officials and Taliban militants began two days of meetings in Kaffa. This was the subject of a New York Times editorial by the editorial board on May 6, 2015 by the newspaper's editorial board which expressed satisfaction over the modest results of a meeting brokered by Pagwash. The editorial concluded and I quote, the tone of the meeting offered a sense of <coughs> promise. The government side included several women and one told the journal that she found the Taliban surprisingly forthcoming with all the delegates. The killing by the Taliban and the government hasn't stopped, but informal talks, talks can, over time, pave the way to formal negotiations and possibly peace." Unquote. Pugwash USA has also played an unpublicized but significant role in the normalization of US-Cuba relations. From the 7th to the 13th September 2014, Dr. Jeffrey Boutwell, Secretary of US Pugwash, and his colleague Mavis Anderson of the Latin American Working Group helped organize a US-Cuba Hemingway commemorative trip to Cuba that involved John and Patrick Hemingway, grandsons of Ernest Hemingway, and several prominent US marine biologists and environmental scientists. With woefully inadequate resources, we continue to work in Afghanistan and elsewhere in the most difficult circumstances. My sincere congratulations and thanks to Professor Paolo Cotta Ramasino and his small team for this. Sandy Butcher, Claudia Vaughan, and Mima have worked unobtrusively to make a huge contribution, and they must know that we are all grateful to them for this. Thank you. Thank you. In its 70th year, the UN remains a universal body which others <coughs> echoes. Transcend, transcending individual state-centered approaches, the UN can take a synoptic view of issues, highlighting a multilateral perspective with global interdependencies clearly delineated. And because these synoptic views are based on consensus, broader public acceptance is made easier. Over the seven decades, the UN's existence has <coughs> seen many successes although major challenges remain. The achievement of the decolonization 
of scores of Asian and African countries, including my own. The focus on human rights and its mainstreaming in international relations. The emphasis on environment and sustainable development, on gender issues and the shaping of a coordinating response to globalization, to terrorism, climate change, and other global challenges like HIV AIDS are some of them. At the same time, the UN has been engaged in the prevention of conflict and where conflict has broken out in peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace building, and disarmament. This is truly a collective achievement. But it also derives from a value base of the organization. Legitimacy and universality are the two pillars of the UN. Beginning with the Charter, which sets out the purposes and principles of the UN, in Chapter 1, there has also been an ethical foundation built over the years. The Millennium Declaration, adopted in September 2000, identified the shared values of the UN community as freedom, equality, solidarity, tolerance, respect for nature, and shared responsibility. No change can affect these values, which represent powerful forces motivating humankind throughout history. They provide what might be called your collective legitimation of the UN, helping the global body to build a normative structure. They have been the accelerators of human progress and the benchmarks for assessing the performance of the UN. The UN is not merely a platform or a forum. It is a depository of values and ideas and an incubator of, of ideas. We thank the UN Secretary General for his message to our conference, read out to us by Under Secretary General Kim Won Soo. One area where our long standing efforts finally bore fruit is with the conclusion of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, between Iran and the 5 plus 1 on Iran's nuclear program. Over the years, as you know, Pankwash has worked patiently and painstakingly for this result through consultations and discrete meetings at times when such meetings were unthinkable and could have caused their participants some discomfiture if disclosed. We congratulate all who contributed to the final result and appeal for good faith implementation of the JCPOA in all its aspects. A press release was issued by Pagwash on the 14th of July, and I shall not read it out. It's available on the website, and you may have already seen it. A direct sequel to JCPOA should be the dismantling, in my view, of the BMD system in Europe, which was used as its rationale the threat from Iran, thereby provoking the Russian Federation. We also expect to see Iran playing a constructive role in Middle East conflicts in the future, and the invitation of that country to Vienna for talks on Syria must be welcomed. On the NPT, where while the Iranian agreement was a success, 45 years after the entry into the force of the treaty, 20 years after the treaty was extended under my presidency by the adoption without a vote of a package, we have the review conference failing to adopt a consensus final document. Apart from persistent differences between the nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, the failure to have any progress on achieving a Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone, and the failure to acknowledge the burgeoning humanitarian initiative were the main reasons. Inevitably, questions are raised on whether the NPT can survive with such failures on fundamental issues. After the conference, the Secretary General and I issued a statement, which again I will not read out because it's available on the website. Ladies and gentlemen, with all nuclear weapon states modernizing their nuclear weapons, the prospects for nuclear disarmament are bleak and non-nuclear weapon states who depend on nuclear deterrence are equally culpable. There are rumors of a U.S.-Pakistani civilian nuclear cooperation deal to parallel the U.S.-India civilian nuclear cooperation agreement. And there are also reports that claim that new U.S. nuclear weapons are to be based in Germany. Meanwhile, eight states have still to ratify the CTPT for it to enter into force and convert the fragile de facto moratorium on testing into a permanent legal norm. I have long believed 
that global peace and security rests on a tripod of military security commensurate with the self-defense needs of nations as permitted by Article 51 of the UN Charter, sustainable development, and human rights. The sad media images of thousands of displaced by conflicts streaming across Europe after braving hazardous sea voyages vividly prove that we have had the largest number of displaced following the conflict since World War II. And yet on their arrival, they are met with discrimination in the countries of temporary refuge they see. The generosity of Chancellor Angela Merkel stands out as a shining example of leadership, compassion, and the common humanity that we in Bugwash uphold. The failure of the major powers and regional powers to agree on a settlement of the crisis in Syria, Yemen, and other countries in the Middle East and stop the flow of arms that is fooling them <coughs> is unconscionable. Greed for power and profits for the arms industry are the obvious drivers of conflict, with global military expenditure estimated at $1.8 trillion in 2014. A sad contrast to the one billion of our fellow human beings living under $1.25 per day, the acknowledged benchmark for absolute poverty. Annual expenditure on nuclear weapons alone is estimated at $105 million, or $12 million per hour. This is scarcely what Article 26 of the UN Charter held out as an idea, and I quote, to promote the establishment and maintenance of international peace and security with the least diversion for armaments of the world's human and economic resources. On economic development, after the commendable progress achieved in meeting targets set out in the Millennium Development Goals in 2015, we have now to address the gaps. The proposed 17 Sustainable Development Goals and 169 targets developed by the Open Working Group in the General Assembly on Sustainable Development Goals will be at the heart of the proposed 2015 Development Agenda. Coming from a developing country myself, I see the transformational impact of these goals and the human dignity that comes with it. The international community has a historic opportunity to finalize a meaningful universal climate agreement in Paris in December 2015. In so doing, we will build a safer, healthier, more equitable world for present and future generations. With the scientific expertise within the Palwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs, I am convinced that we can make a contribution to the Paris Conference. And I propose that Pugwash address an appeal to the Paris Conference from here, Nagasaki. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, let me recall that this city of Nagasaki and the Glover Garden, where we were just yesterday, are linked to Puccini's great opera, Madame Butterfly which many of us have seen on stages in various cities. The encounter between East and West need not have tragic results. And the architectural beauty of the Dejima quarter of this historic city shows how constructive transcontinental partnerships can be. The proposal to have the Pagwash Conference in Nagasaki was conceived and discussed with Pagwash Japan for about three years. In fact, I visited the site of the conference a year ago and I'm personally delighted that this conference has been such a splendid success. A great tribute must be paid to the government of Japan, the governor of the Nagasaki prefecture, the mayor and the city of Nagasaki, and of course, to the team from Pagwat, Japan, led by Professor Tatsu Suzuki, whose relocation to this city after his magnificent work on the Fukushima crisis was so fortuitous. A big Arigato gozaimashita to all of you. Thank you.